these people continue to support Democrats who, who, who give them a poor quality of life and basically their neighborhoods are war zones. I, I declared that back in 07 on the radio. That these are war zones. By any definition, the south side and the west side is nothing but a war zone. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Terry Martin with the Illinois Channel. Jeff Berkowitz, Chicago, Illinois. And ladies and gentlemen, that was just uh, Charles Butler, a black conservative who's well known in the Chicago area, and he actually is on a radio station, their radio broadcast it does. It's heard around the country. And Jeff Berkowitz interviewed Mr. Butler just recently about crime in Chicago. And since that interview, when we were talking about crime, or Jeff was talking about crime, something new has happened. Jeff, what's the latest? Well, the war zone erupted because we taped that show, as you said, Terry, last Wednesday, and two days later, what happened in the war zone? The war zone is the south side of Chicago, the west side of Chicago. Two women who've been working hard with masks, Mothers Again, Senseless Killings, M-A-S-K. It's, it's almost ironic, but it's awful. These women are out there in Inglewood on the south side, late Friday night, two days later, what happens? Car goes by, a little drive-by shooting. They're both shot in the chest. Shortly thereafter, they're pronounced dead at the University of Chicago Medical Center in Hyde Park, not far from Inglewood. All of it not far from downtown Chicago, maybe six or seven miles from that area. Because it's a war zone, Terry. And these people were in the war, and they join masks, and they say, we're taking back our neighborhood. We're going to be out here. We, we're here with our kids. It's Friday night. It's a summer night. We should be able to do this. You know, I was, no, you can't. Ladies, you know, no, you can't because they're war zone. Okay? I was with you, Jeff, as uh, you were interviewing Charles off camera, and you were kind of arguing with him that maybe he was going a little too far. Uh, in light of these shootings, has anything changed in your attitude? No, I, I brought Charles into the uh, press conference just uh, on Tuesday. What are we taping this? That was Wednesday. Well, we, the mayor has every week. There used to be Accountability Monday. She sifted to Accountability Tuesday. Every week she meets with the superintendent of police, Eddie Johnson. They have their little little uh, discussion of what happened that weekend, and then she comes out and meets with the press. Well, this is a big deal. There have been kind of quiet meetings. I've been there, a few other media people. But for this one, the media got there going. It was, uh, and they got maybe 15 people in the media. And basically they're saying, WTF, what happened here? Okay. And, you know, the mayor's saying, well, you know, well, this is terrible. This is terrible. What happened to these two women? It's, you know, terrible. They're trying to retake the neighborhood and they're, and they're shot. They're murdered. Okay. The various senseless killings they were protesting, they become victims. How is that played okay. up in Chicago? Did that create a, a new scandal in, in the city? No, oh, no, Terry, because this is a war zone that doesn't affect the shiny city the downtown area. You and I are discussing it, and we realize how terrible it is. It happens on Friday night. Another similar shooting occurs on Sunday. On Tuesday, they get a big write-up in the Chicago Tribune. Five effing days later, okay? It's just not a big deal. You got more people talking about the president and racist comments and so forth than talking about right down the road, if you're on the north side, if you're, if you're in the better part of Chicago, in Lincoln Park, okay? Some of even the better parts on the south side, west side, doesn't involve you. Let me, let me just. Doesn't involve you. We have uh, from about a year ago, actually a little over a year ago, April of 2018, uh, some comments we're going to play by uh, the chief uh, superintendent of the police, uh, Eddie Johnson. And to set it up, we're also going to play uh, shortly after that a bite from uh, Mr. Butler again. The argument on the two sides, and I should say, Mr. Butler respects uh, Chief Eddie uh, Johnson, but uh, the argument is, are we, are we forcing the police for political purposes to go too soft on these criminals and should we have harder policing? Let's first listen to what Eddie Johnson said in April of 2018 about fighting violence. Well, I do believe that, that CPD should do a better job in, in the way we conduct our street stops. I, I do. I also believe, though, that, that we should be stopping the right people for the right reasons at the right time. And, and simply put, 
you know, when we get descriptions of possible offenders, if they meet a certain criteria, then those are the individuals we should be stopping. So the ACLU, the, that agreement did have an effect on us in terms of the amount of street stops that we had. It went down by 80% in a couple of months. But what I always pivot to is this. Although we saw our street stops reduce dramatically, we saw our gun arrests go up. And they've gone up ever since we signed that agreement. So what that tells me is that we have done a better job training our police officers and identifying the right people to stop for the right reasons at the right times. Uh, but I, I do think we have to recognize we have to give these police officers the tools that they need to help keep the citizens of this city safe. So well, somebody's got to look. Uh, Eddie Johnson's a wonderful guy, and you know Charles Butler likes him, and uh, and Eddie Johnson says some nice things about Charles Butler. He said he's a good man. He's got a lot of passion, but he's going to do things the the old way. It's a policing issue, okay? It's not a war zone. Because I asked him that, okay? And I said you got to, you have to. I said use the word that uh, Charles uses in an interview. He says you've got to eradicate eradicate these gang members okay i didn't hear i didn't hear eddie johnson saying that you know they'll go after them they'll try to get them they'll investigate you know somebody's got to say it's got to change it's got to change now and you're right it's getting worse it's not getting better recent judicial decision we won't go we could recent judicials just listen to this in cook county cook county was one of the few counties actually where you could arrest somebody not with a judicial warrant but simply with the supervisor and the police signing off on it a recent appellate decision in cook county in state court from a name really of pachinski people will know he's an appellate justice well-known name in chicago michael hyman a guy i know they decided you can no longer do this they shouldn't make an exception chicago should make it different you want to arrest somebody go get a judge to issue a warrant I'm not saying right or wrong, but that makes it a little tougher. Bail is much easier for people who are arrested. The police and the mayor have been complaining recently. You arrest somebody, and the next day they're out on bail. You arrest them from unauthorized use of a gun, okay? Serious matter. The next day they're out. Cook County Board President Preckwinkle says, that's not the problem. You're not getting people. You're not getting them convicted and so forth. My point, Terry, is people got to sit down. President of the Cook County Board, the police chief, the mayor, not two weeks from now. They got to sit down, they got to get it right, and they got to do a change. Let's, uh, in, in contrast to that, your interview that you just did with uh, Charlie Butler, Charles Butler, uh, let's take a listen to what Mr. Butler was saying as far as how he would handle the approach and what we need to do to fight crime. Well, I would turn Eddie Johnson loose to get out and do policing, and I would make police officers police criminals. What I've observed from police officers in black communities is they tend to avoid black criminals, and they prey on law-abiding citizens, people who are not dangerous people. That's what I've observed personally. Uh, and I think that police need to get tough with these criminals. They need to, to attack criminal gangs. Criminal gangs need to be identified as urban terrorists and they need to be prosecuted under RICO acts under the RICO act and the RICO statutes. There was a judge in New York who did exactly what I said uh, he prosec he's prosecuting gang members as terrorists. That's what they are. That's the point. He, you know, Charles Butler has to sit down and talk with the mayor because as I, when I said this to the superintendent and what the mayor was saying at the press conference before the superintendent is, look, we're doing this, crime is trending down, homicides are trending down, shootings are trending down, but they were trending down before. They're still double what they are in Chicago, excuse me, in Los Angeles and New York when you're talking about homicides. So she would admit they're still way too high, but this kind of thing is just totally reprehensible. Not that any homicides are okay, but People might say, look, if it's one gangbanger killing another gangbanger, that's one thing. I'm not saying anybody's life is uh, okay to lose it. But if it's a gangbanger shooting two moms who are protesting senseless killings, there's no words to describe that. There should be outrage. The mayor and the superintendent should be saying, we're working on this tomorrow morning, Jeff. We're going to get it changed. But they're not. 
you know, so it, somebody's got to shake them up. Like the people in Chicago, and this happens in other cities, they become too accustomed uh, to this violence, and it no longer impacts them, and they become blind to it. And I want to connect a couple of dots here, and I we're going to be going on talking about some of the congressional races coming up. I think this is going to become increasingly, or should become increasingly, an issue going into 2020 at, at, at the local level, at the congressional level. And what's been in the news? We've had the president making comments uh, about Baltimore and, and saying that Mr. Cummings, the representative from that area, should be focusing more on his district. We've seen all kinds of videos coming out of there where Baltimore has gone dramatically downhill. There's trash and all left over. And, you know, maybe there is an argument to be made here that, folks, we need to be holding those people in political power from those districts where uh, they need to be reformed, holding them more accountable and quit kind of just saying, well, that's the south side of Chicago. That's the west side of Chicago. What do you expect? As long as Michigan Avenue is pristine, we're good to go. Well, yeah, it's, you know, the president could speak more thoughtfully and more particularly. But to, but to spend all of the time talking about whether a word he used, it's used by many people, is not racist, is racist, whether he refers to areas of having a lot of rodents and rats, you know, and whether when he says Baltimore, of course, there are fine parts of Baltimore that are affluent, that are doing well. Johns Hopkins University is there. Medical centers there. So, yes, he should have said portions of Baltimore. But the point is, are you going to do something to fix the bad parts of Baltimore? Are you going to do something to fix the bad parts of inner cities across the country? And Trump should be doing that, working with Democrats and Republicans. And you're right. I'm t we're talking about an issue local to Chicago, but it is, it is something, and some would say why Trump was elected, without saying whether that's good or bad. Most people would realize Trump, Democrats and Republicans would say Trump picked up on something that other Republicans and Democrats didn't pick up. Maybe this will happen. Maybe Lori Lightfoot did that when she became mayor of Chicago, her first elected office, beat somebody in a runoff who'd been in politics for 30 years. So as we enter the 2020 national election, and we're now in the 2020 Democratic primary, maybe people ought to sort of get a grip, okay? They're talking about, they're debating, should we, you know, decriminalize people crossing our borders illegally? Should we let everybody come in who wants to come in, okay? Should we give free health care to every person who's an illegal immigrant? And people are watching this and saying, what? With the problems we have in this country, that's the debate? So I think you're right. This local thing we're talking about has national implications. And we got to be talking about our problems differently. We got to be addressing. 50 years ago, somebody in a movie made a name for, I think it was called Network, and he stood up and said, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Guess what? That guy's still there. 50 years later, and he's being asked to take it. You also asked uh, Mr. Butler in the interview you did. We don't have a clip of this, but I remember you saying, um, you know, asking him about the performance of Eddie Johnson, and he said uh, that he respects him, but he said his hands are tied, and basically saying that, you know, he's, he's being kind of held back, and the police are being held back by, by politicians who are putting... Well, and maybe it's or, even... And this not only in Chicago, this is happening in other places. We see the change from uh, how Rudy Giuliani was uh, policing in New York City now to uh, the current mayor there, where it's uh, like policing light. We saw, in fact, video just come out, what was it, uh, of New York City, I think, where we, we had people on the street pouring buckets of water over police and they were just walking away. Uh, right, you know, I mean, that never would have happened with me. People who said they w we would have brought dogs in there, uh, you know, police dogs, and supported the police. And we so the argument is, some say, you know, we're we've had police overreacting, uh, but others now are saying we've so tied the hands of police, we're we're putting so much pressure on the police officers on the street that they, uh, the accusation is that they can't do their job, and this is the violence we see exploding worse and worse. Uh, 
as a result. All right, and the General Assembly in New York is reacting apparently with passing legislation that will make it a felony to throw water or acid or anything else at police. Right now, it's a misdemeanor. And people may say, oh, what's the problem with throwing a little water? Well, you dump some water. What is to say it can't be something different? And these are supposed to be law enforcement people who are there to protect and serve us, serve, and we respect. Do you really usually walk up to people who are risking their lives to make the city safe for you and throw water on them? So I think you're right. We have to recast how we look at these things. Politicians have to do their job. And, and the... These sort of local issues are becoming national issues. And I think we're respect, we are reasonably asking our local politicians, our police chiefs, and our national politicians to do more. Now, you say they're tying the hands of police. Maybe too many police chiefs are going along with this. And maybe when they differ from what the politicians are doing, what the mayors are doing, they need to speak out. They need to say, I mean, it may sound tough. But yeah, it's a war zone. We're not talking about removing people's civil liberties. Well, Jeff, We're know, talking about ratcheting up our enforcement of the law while observing civil liberties. We, we, to your credit, it was your interview. You organized the interview with Mr. Butler. But the point is that we, you uh, in Chicago and the Illinois Channel, we, we don't want to just be doing Me Too journalism. We want to bring people voices out there that represent views that maybe they don't often hear. So we had that uh, with your interview with Mr. Butler. Just to move on to slightly, one of the things that is happening, it's not directly related to crime, but indirectly it might be a big influence, and that is that we just passed uh, a couple of major pieces of legislation in the spring session. One was the gaming bill and the other uh, the $45 billion dollar a capital bill, and the hope is that we can go into areas all across the state with the capital bill and do some rebuilding, improve not just roads, but improve some of the buildings. Uh, and also, it is expected that we would, with the gaming, uh, bring in more money to some of these areas, provide more jobs. Let's listen to uh, that uh, comments by Governor Pritzker. Uh, about three weeks ago, when he was down at Walker's Bluff Winery, just outside of Carbondale, and he spoke on what his hopes were for the $45 billion gaming or capital bill and, and what impact it would have. Overall, we're investing $45 billion over six years to repair what's broken and build what's needed, all while supporting hundreds of thousands of jobs throughout our state. We're all well aware of the fiscal challenges Illinois has faced, but after decades of disinvestment and passing the buck, this year Democrats and Republicans came together to say enough is enough. Together we passed the largest, most robust capital plan in our state's history, and we did it in the very best traditions of democracy, a bipartisan commission, commission a bipartisan commitment, a bipartisan commitment to better the lives of all of our people. And you should all be very proud of that. People walking across the aisle to talk to one another, to get real things done for people living right here. We're reshaping the future of our state and we're making investments in every region. Well, the, the governor's right. It's a major bill, the $45 billion capital plan he's talking about the gaming expansion, the expansion of marijuana, the criminal justice, all of that, okay? Major stuff. But one thing, don't push too much. That is, uh, don't expect too much, but if you can get things if you have a strategic plan. I don't think there's any strategic plan for spending this money, for making sure it's not poor, for making sure it's done efficiently. If we're any major company that had a plan to spend $45 billion over six years, and I think that's the plan, issue bonds for $21 billion, I think there'd be some paper that put it down that the public could see. You know, there's a there's a page or two that says, here's $45 billion, and here's where it's gonna come from, and here's where it's gonna go, but they don't have the specific projects. We don't know what universities it's going to. I don't think we do, not publicly. We don't know what's gonna happen at those universities. We don't know what the major roads are that are gonna be repaired, or major expressways. So get a, get a strategic plan, get it on the website, 
make sure you, Terry Martin, Jeff Berkowitz, and all the other media, and all the other people who state can easily find it, and they can comment it before it's done, and they can be watchdogs to make sure it's done efficiently. Okay, so that's one advice for the governor. The other is, you take something like Chicago. You know, the, there are six cities that are going to get new casinos. Chicago is one of them. They've got somebody, I think by statute, they're permitted to pay or maybe required to pay a consultant $100,000, maybe $120,000 to recommend a site. So I know they're looking at five different sites for Chicago. Kristen McQuarrie is a Chicago Tribune editorial board member with a column which she writes as well for the Chicago Tribune. She said, let's cut to the chips. Okay. These five sites, there's really, you got to be near the, you got to be near McCormick Place where the people come in from out of town and want something to do at night. And you got to be near in a safe place where the seniors can go from 10 to 5 and play the slots and do the other stuff they do. In other words, it's about the money. It's about the money for the city of Chicago. It's about the money for the state of Illinois. And, and it's about the money for the person, the entity that's going to run this place and has to make money or they won't do it. It's not a jobs program. Well, let's see it would be nice happens, if you could. You know. It would be nice if you could develop the economy. But that's anyway. That's your point of view, and I think a lot of that makes sense. I think the thing you're saying is, look, when you're spending this kind of money, you ought to have greater transparency on what these projects are doing. Where's this money going to go? The forty-five billion dollar capital bill is going to be spent over six years. So uh, we just had it signed into law about a month ago. Uh, and it should. Hopefully we get our money's worth out of $45 billion and we see not only better roads and bridges, but uh, that we can just see across the board a, a better state. Uh, and there's certainly all kinds of things that need to be fixed up. Jeff, let's move along before time runs out. Uh, obviously, we're going to be going into 2020. As we tape this, we are having at the national level, the Democrats uh, debating, their presidential candidates are debating, but also obviously the Democrats now hold the House of Representatives while the Republicans in the U.S. Congress hold the Senate. The Republicans are looking to take that back. One of the congressional races in Illinois that the Republicans are hoping to take back is one they had held for a long time until this past November, uh, we had the uh, election of Sean Caston defeating then uh, Peter Roskam. And this is a seat the Republicans had held for quite some time. And you see there, Sean Caston won that by 53.6 to 46.4, a difference of about 22,500 votes. And Jeff, uh, what are your thoughts on the Republicans taking that back? Well, it's a tough seat, as you point out, a long time. Peter Roskam, Congressman Roskam, had it for 12 years. Before him, like forever, Henry Hyde had it. So it had been, all that time, a strong Republican district. Peter only won by 2%, but each year after, it got stronger. When it was an open seat, those, rates, those races are often highly contested and competitive. Now, you know, as you point out, that was like a 23,000 vote margin for Sean Caston over Peter Roskam. And there's a Republican primary because Evelyn, Evelyn Sanguinetti got in and then, and then somebody you just interviewed, uh, she has jumped in the race too, right? Right. We, we recently, we got, as you just said, we have two names, two women, one the former Lieutenant Governor Sanguinetti and the person that tried to defeat Governor Rauner and Evelyn Sanguinetti, Jeannie Ives. Jeannie Ives now running for the 6th Congressional seat. She from Wheaton, I spoke with her recently, the day after she announced on what some of the issues that she would hope to focus on. And we can align interests and, and get something done on bringing down health care costs, opening up the marketplace to that. Uh, I would love to tackle higher education costs. Want to, I want to definitely get something done like that. On that, border security is high on my list. The rule of law, enforcing the rule of law is very important because if we fail to enforce the law in one respect, then how can we be legitimately enforce it and enforce it in any respect? And so uh, I think there's some core issues that have to be handled in terms of illegal immigration, border security, which secures the people and the citizens in this country. Well, this is going to be a hot race in the Republican primary because I'm sure you got Governor Rauner backing up Evelyn Sanguetti, 
Sanguinetti, and and I'm sure Peter Roskam will be there backing up Janie Ives. And this is a conservative district, especially in the Republican primary. So you'd have to look at it and say, Jeannie Ives, who is a strong, staunch conservative on economic issues, on social issues, on all issues, and generally got a lot of a lot of credit for the way she ran her campaign as a consistent, thoughtful conservative. And uh, as many of her supporters say, if they had another week, she would have been the Republican nominee, not Bruce Rauner, for governor in the state of Illinois. So she got it close. She got it within 20,000 votes. And now we're going to see a fierce battle between Sanguinetti and, um, and Jeannie Ives. And in fact, one of somebody you and, and I both know, Mike Flannery, interviewed Evelyn Sanguinetti on Flannery on Fire, and I think he got a clip of that good interview. We do, and interestingly, remember, uh, one of the things Republicans held against Governor Rauner is that he signed HB 40. Mike Flannery asked Evelyn Sanguinetti whether or not she supported that bill, which would provide for taxpayer funding for abortions. House Bill 40, the abortion bill, that allowed for public funding of abortion. I was not And the governor there. said poor women deserve it just the way rich women do. I, I did not support that bill, and I'll tell you why. You know, my mother chose to have me and keep me as a Cuban refugee at the age of 15. That is something I did not know before, but it certainly puts an interesting spin on it, Jeff, that her mother had her at 15. And Sanguinetti <laughs> said to Flannery uh, in other parts of that interview that... Uh, she quietly disappeared, or disagreed with the governor around her on that, as we heard somewhat there. But Jeannie Ives said, well, she thinks Sanguinetti didn't uh, protest enough. Well, yeah. And, and you know, again, that, that clip that you have is an interesting clip. A good interview by Mike Flannery. That's on Fox 32 News, WFLD here in Chicago program, Flannery on Fire, which appears three, night, three days a week on Friday night, Saturday night, and then Sunday morning. And, uh, you know, yeah, I didn't really recall, you and I both followed that closely. I just never heard Evelyn Sanguinetti sort of separate herself from the governor when he came out for tax funded, when he signed the bill for tax funded abortions. I never heard her say, you know, well, here's a case where I generally, I don't support the governor and here's why. So. I think she might have a little bit of trouble trying to make that story. She's against taxpayer-funded abortions. She might have been a little bit too quiet, but, you know, we'll both look to interview Evelyn, and if she wants to make that argument, we don't decide. It's the viewers who will decide. Yeah, if we're gonna be, and, uh, and, of course, there'll be many other issues in that race. Yeah, we're going to be uh, looking at some of the other districts, too. We'll try to get a hold of uh, uh, Congressman Kasten so we can have an interview with him and have his views. We're going to be taking a look at a number of the different representatives uh, uh, across the state of Illinois. There's probably about four or five of them that are going to be really in play. Um, as we approach the end of the show once again, as you often say, Jeff, the fastest 30 minutes in television. Um, Time goes all too fast with you, Jerry. We, uh, we have tonight uh, a couple of interesting things. Of course, as we tape this, we have the Democrats debating, and we have the Cubs and the Cardinals playing in St. Louis, and that's also got the attention of people on both ends of the state. And we have the Governor's Day, Democrat Day coming up, as well as Republican Day at the State Fair. I think that's August 14th and 15th, right? That, that's right. And so uh, the Illinois Channel will be out there covering those speeches as we have for years. Uh, and uh, Jeff will bring you those. And I'll say to you, good night. And we'll see, you see you next week. See you next week, Terry.